Do you have any kind of that thing you created last time was awesome? Uh, did you create that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Holding to, to the currency um, has been a missing link um, in, in the mission to establish um, a global currency in the lack of, of a global government. Um, and if this is our aim, then we're not really a stable coin because we aspire intrinsic value. Uh, we, we aspire Saga to, uh, to have the value of, of a global uh, network of exchange. Um, I think if we're labeled a stable coin, it is because we, are, we believe that it is crucial um, to integrate stabilization mechanisms uh, on our way to this intrinsic value. Um, eventually, we are offering people who are trusting an existing contract, which is fiat currency, um, to, um, to trust a new contract that by design has not yet demonstrated value. Um, and, and, and this request for trust is, um, is, is representing a risk. Um, and this risk is uh, in turn translated into speculation and into volatility, which is a sort of a vicious circle uh, preventing uh, um, a sustainable growth um, of, of a currency. And so we believe that it is uh, very important to use stabilization mechanisms um, on our way to, to an intrinsic value, mechanisms that will definitely slow down the growth or the, the, the appreciation of Saga, but will um, ensure that we are able to proceed and to grow um, in, a, in a more sustainable, in a less volatile, uh, volatile way. Um, I, I think uh, it's um, interesting to note that any currency, whether it's fiat or crypto, has already stabilization as a part of its definition, uh, in the sense that uh, a currency is, is really answering three functions of being a store of value, um, a medium of exchange, and a unit of account. Now, while the store of value always, uh, uh, it, it, the store of value feature is always looking towards appreciation, um, the medium of exchange feature is one that desires stability. Um, if a merchant is to favor one currency over the other, it is because she knows that the next day she can meet their obligations. And she can only do that if the value of this currency is stable. So I think that well, for most currencies um, who, who are looking to have an intrinsic value, uh, the, the, the true source or the true question lies in the balance between stability and, and prospect. Um, and we, we uh, designed Saga um, trying to reach such a balance to integrate stabilization mechanisms um, in, into the contract. Um, when we started Saga a year ago, um, we identified three challenges or three main challenges um, that the entire industry is facing and, and us amongst it. Um, the, the first uh, one is, uh, is, is the challenge of knowledge. It is the fact that currencies cannot be led uh, by technology experts only. Um, it is mostly um, about determining policy, monetary policy, and uh, we simply don't have the, the required knowledge to do it on our own. Um, it is rather an interdisciplinary approach of combining um, philosophers and economists and social scientists and technology experts as well, um, on top of mathematicians um, and, and, and the such. It, it's, it makes sense for, um, technology experts to invent cryptocurrencies as much as it would have made sense for those brilliant engineers that were responsible for the cheap printing machines 200 years ago, um, those machines that allows us to print banknotes uh, to be the ones responsible uh, for the creation of the central banks. Um, it requires an interdisciplinary effort. Um, and we were very much reliant on the expertise um, and, and on trial and error done by central banks and, and macroeconomics over the last hundred years or more uh, in determining what could possibly work uh, in this new money experiment and, and, and what uh, uh, was trialed and, and would not work. And so it was very important to us to uh, uh, integrate within the effort of designing Saga um, knowledge from central banks, 
um, macroeconomics knowledge uh, on top of, of uh, technology knowledge. Uh, the second issue that um, we, uh, was clear to us that we need to deal with, um, and I think it's one that is broadly dealt with uh, in the entire blockchain community, is the one of identity. Um, we are designing um, a um, cross-nation contract, a global contract, but we do not have a global government. Um, and with that, uh, we cannot uh, uh, pretend to enforce accountability between participants in Saga, which means that we don't have any tool to make sure that people are paying taxes for, uh, to ride on the road that their taxes paid. Um, and if that's the case, then uh, our approach is that we owe identity uh, to nation states uh, for them to be able to uh, continue and perform the role of enforcing accountability between, between their citizens. And that if we deny the nation state from, from identity, from its ability to perform its uh, job, we at least don't get to be surprised that nation states are reluctant to adopt, uh, to adopt those uh, new currencies. Um, at the same time, it was very important that there is a, a, a strong difference between privacy and confidentiality. Um, that while we want to allow regulatory disclosure, we want to make sure that uh, uh, we are leveraging blockchain to make sure that uh, the identity of our participants remains uh, privileged and private, private not only from others, but from our own praying eyes. Um, and uh, last but not least, how, how to balance stability and growth, how to integrate stabilization mechanisms um, into the model of Saga. Um, I think we're seeing three main approaches in the uh, called stablecoin environment. One where um, a currency holds to the, tar to the stabilization target. So if, if we want to stabilize against something, we first need to ask, ask ourselves what it is that we want to be stable uh, against. Um, and the, the probably simply, simplest way to stabilize against something is to hold it, even physically. And, and so there is the approach of if we want to be stable against uh, um, fiat currencies, then we need to hold fiat currencies. Um, some other projects are opting uh, to hold another target and, and to try and create algorithmically a relation between the stabilization target and the target that they're holding. Like, if I want to stabilize against fiat, I can hold Ether in different liquidity levels um, and, and regulate the relations between Ether and, and, and fiat. And the third uh, option is to hold to yourself or create an algorithmic balancing of the supply of money um, to try and target fiat currencies. Um, and, and we're seeing many variants of, of, uh, of, of those possibilities. Um, we've op opted uh, for the first as a stabilization mechanism. So um, we are uh, holding um, uh, the SDR as our target again is to create the global counterpart currency um, we were looking to hold the basket of fiat currencies, but one that are not fragile to one single nation state uh, uh, policy. And, and the SDR is a basket of currency that is uh, uh, determined by the IMF. Um, it is comprised of five dominant uh, currencies in different ways. Um, the US dollar, the euro, the pound, the yen, and uh, the latest edition was the renminbi, Chinese renminbi. And uh, we've designed the model um, following the, 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 uh, the following principle, which is that the currency is but a quantifier of trust and agreement. And like any other new currency, when we launch Saga, uh, we will enjoy no trust and no agreement, and therefore we get to enjoy no intrinsic value. So um, rather than arbitrarily uh, decide of a supply, of an initial supply of Saga, uh, when Saga is launched, there are zero Sagas in the world. Um, and the first, uh, the, the, the supply of money of Saga is fully flexible, so that uh, when one buys Saga from the Ethereum contract, Saga is created, and if Saga is sent back to the contract, um, it, is being, um, it is being burnt. Um, and as, as a result, um, the number of Sagas in the world is, is expressing the level of public trust in Saga. 
And so we start with 100% backing in SDR. So the value of SAGA is just the value of SDR it holds in reserve in regulated banks. Uh, but as the number of SAGAs uh, in the world increases, um, the reserve ratio out of the price of SAGA is decreasing in favor of the intrinsic appreciation that SAGA um, enjoys. Um, hey, you know, this is, this is great stuff. Um, and, uh, nice thing is we've got time at the end for more questions. But let me just ask, you know, one more question before we get to the next speaker. As you think about, um, you know, the decreasing this reserve ratio, kind of what's your thoughts on kind of the, the, the timing of, you know, when, you know, and, and I realize it's based on uh, how much and not time, but kind of what are your thoughts on, you know, time as it relates to how much has been minted? So uh, w one of the fundamental principles of our model is path independence. It means that it is not relying on, on how long um, it takes to get from one quantity of saga to another, um, but, but, but rather uh, any, quant any uh, named quantity of saga um, is, is determining the reserve ratio and the, and the saga price. Uh, we definitely hope to achieve in the first uh, few years um, several billion dollars in reserve. Uh, to be able to demonstrate um, to ourselves and to the world um, that um, the model is um, um, is, is well balanced um, to to uh, to strike this uh, this uh, equilibrium between uh, growth and and volatility. Okay, terrific. Uh, uh, thanks for that. Uh, and with that, we'll uh, turn it over to Sam Trotwin. Sam. Hey guys, um, let me get the screen sharing up. Okay. Um, where, where is it? And Ido, if you could mute your microphone, thanks. Okay, we good? Yep. Perfect. Hi guys, I'm the I'm Sam Droutwine. I'm co-founder and CEO of Carbon. Um, yeah, so value transfers know it. Um, there's high fees, Swift credit cards, etc. It's slow, low customizability. It's expensive res resolution. Money is one of the earliest inventions. Um, money's kind of been fundamental to um, society and just kind of governments. And in, in the main, in many ways, it's kind of the foundational service that the state provides to everyone. Um, and throughout most of history, it's just been, um, there's been massive problems with money. In general, um, it correlates pretty strongly to the hard power of a given state um, because it comes under the state's ability to enforce both um, the lack of dilution um, as well as the general acceptance of any currency. Um, distributed ledger technology has given us a ability to ensure the lack of dilution um, programmatically rather than using hard power and that that gives um that's kind of created a landscape where it's now viable for non-government parties to actually um to actually compete in the space of currency um the, the main problem that we've had with many historical currencies um was that there was always a very strong incentive to counterfeit and this this broke the first this broke the first um initial global currency system because certain states there's a standard. Um, there's a standard back in the early 1900s to create a global currency by basically getting by having governments com having governments um, manipulate the currencies into being one to one. But specific states, namely in this case the papal states, um, just simply cheated and would always just kind of add um, less pure metals to their coins. And the dilution problem is kind of the main problem that the shooter ledgers have the um, opportunity of solving because we can trust code. Um, to provide, um, if not limited, at least, um, well, if not limited in the hard, in the sense of a hard cap, limited in the sense of we know how many are in circulation at any given time um, to all actors. Um, so the stablecoin landscape really has kind of three different approaches. There's the fiat-backed, the crypto-backed, and the uncollateralized. All these, um, this entire spectrum, to the, to the left, um, we have centralized risk, and to the right, we have decentralized risk. Um, and there's also a pretty strong correlation to the kind of profitability of the system as well um, towards the right. Um, and all three of these have um, positives and negatives, which are pretty laid out on the slides. Um, but yeah, the main thing is kind of if you want decentralized or centralized risk or points of failure. Um, 
So what's holding cryptocurrency back? Why hasn't it seen broader adoption, adoption by mainstream society um, today? Um, the two main reasons are throughput and volatility. So far, um, the throughput in the, in, um, the crypt cryptocurrency space has been relatively low compared to the technology that came before it. Um, and that just kind of makes it not viable for many things that we, are, uh, many of us in the space are very excited about. Micropayments um, have been heavily on having a high throughput because the amount of transactions you can do per second and the cost of said transactions just depends on that. Um, volatility has also been a huge problem because it makes it pretty bad for most of the functions of money. Um, you can't use it as a unit, unit of accounting. You can't use it as a store of value. So um, both these things have been just very much in the way of widespread use by um, most people of crypto. Um, there's a um, lot of people working on fixing throughput. Um, there's a, and there's a, like, we're fairly confident um, and we're fairly confident that throughput will um, improve drastically in the coming years. Um, and, our personal favorite horse is today our hash graph, but um, there's a lot of bright minds on this problem. Volatility. And Sam, that, that, I'm, I'm sorry, just do you care whether the throughput is centralized or decentralized? Uh, it has to be decentralized. Well, like for the sake of cryptocurrencies, it has to be decentralized. Anything that's centralized gets back to the trust problem. Like we're, ba we're basically back to um, if, if, you can, if groups can manipulate the um, – if all the – different parties can't see the amount of coins in circulation. We're back to the problem that we've had with um, non-hard power backed fiat currencies. Um, so we're back to the problem where if, if you can't, um, if you can't, if you don't, tr if there's a difference between what you think, if there's a difference between what you how many dollars you believe are in circulation and how many actually are, um, then there's a problem. And we've, the only way we've been able to get away from this historically has been through hard power. Um, so it has to be decentralized fundamentally. Um, yeah, so stable coins are the solution to the volatility problem. Um, so specifically, we believe the route towards um, uncollateralization or uncollateralized is very risky because something that's kind of not really talked about much in the space is that people have been trying this for a long time. Um, someone named John Ma tried this in France back in the like back um, in the 16 or 1700s. Um, Governments haven't really been able to do this until the 70s um, because what you're basically doing is collateralizing against the value of your actual payment processing network. Um, and so the target, how we're going about moving forward here is just making, um, is making a generational leap forward in um, payment processing so we can collateralize against that. Um, this is a just an illustration of how complex payment processing is now. I mean, I can give, I can, I can talk for hours around just problems in that space. Um, we mostly had that slide just to emphasize the complexity. Um, so transaction fees are also high because everything that's in that, everything that was in the slide before has to be paid for by the parties sending or receiving the transactions. So the more complexity you add, the more the costs stack up. So what we really are trying to build is a language of value, decentralized with arbitrary complexity and um, social resolution. And I use social because there's really not a word for um, what we're trying to have, which is kind of, we want something that, um, is appropriate to the use case and driven by the community rather than a um, central authority. Currently, the Visa network processes most um, non-business transactions around the globe. Um, the Visa network's kind of crown jewel is a mainframe computer in upstate New York that processes around 80% of their transactions. They have a backup somewhere in the country that they route some transactions through um, just so they have it in case the mainframe goes down. They also have a 700-page rulebook, um, which is kind of the main source of trust for most of the people using the Visa network. Um, that rule book is in a sense actually Visa's greatest asset because the reason people trust the Visa network is because they can is they can look through this rule book to figure out um, how any disputes will get resolved, how um, what rights they have, what rights the counterparty has. Um, and the more payments you're processing, the more you care about these things. Um, like you can bet your bottom dollar that the big groups that use the Visa network like Walmart and so forth have teams of lawyers and accountants scouring this rule book. And so we, um, the, the illustration here, the node in the middle um, for the centralized version is the Visa network now. We envision a reality where um, consumer advocacy organizations and, cor and corporate organizations can work together to kind of draft the terms and conditions surrounding the value transfer between both parties. Um, and this is beneficial because when you have a centralized node, it's not as reactive to developments in both tech and in trends. 
because Visa has to um, Visa has to kind of manually update the rulebook for everyone, rather than allowing parties to change their own terms and conditions as needed. Um, an example of why this matters: um, cryptocurrencies were not considered a cash-like asset until three or four months ago. Um, you were able to um, you were able to. This was also a problem in the in the um, 90s or like late 90s or early 2000s, where you're able to use your credit cards to buy um, cash cards to pay off your credit cards, which was great for people doing it. Um, I was actually I was actually doing this with crypto back in the day, where I was just um, loading up credit card rewards by buying crypto, then flipping it and paying off the bills with the crypto. Um, but so things like this ultimately are kind of a tax on the system because the people who ultimately pay for this are the average consumer. Um, and so loopholes will get closed faster, which will increase the overall efficiency as well as increase the trust in the system because everyone using Visa is trusting Visa to maintain um, the resolution rules. But, and the question comes up, this was touched on, Ito you know, covered this nicely as well, but um, we're touched on this as well. There's a question of why stop here. Um, there's a kind of, there's a myth in people who have some econ exposure, not a ton, that U.S. inflation has kind of run at 3% like clockwork. If you look at the graph, the graph on the left, that's just not true. We think we can do, we think that longer term, we can do better than the dollar. And we can't do this right now. There's a whole host of reasons why we can't do this right now. Um, and this is something that I could also talk about for hours. But our longer term vision is, um, is eventually kind of breaking off the dollar. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for this. The dollar is kind of the gold standard, um, if, you, if you'll excuse my pun, um, for global currencies right now. There's, we've never seen anything like it. It's an economic innovation, and it's backed by the largest military in the world. Lots of hard power there. Um, but we think that eventually, if, we, if, we're able to, if we're able to build a payments network and a um, global asset that is more valuable than the American government, that we can move off the dollar to something more... Um, to something less centralized. Um, and this would have to be, and this would, there's a whole host of reasons why I can't do this today, but we, we envision a future where every government has their own cryptocurrency and carbon is something bigger than all of those. Um, yeah, so. Could you talk a little bit about how you would meet regulations across multiple countries to do something like that? Sure, it's actually easier. So ironically, um, a lot of countries that have, um, one of the reasons a lot of projects are actually choosing SDR is many countries actually have regulations against private currencies. Um, and this is less common in kind of more developed economies because the governments feel less threatened. But um, in, many, in many like less developed countries, um, there actually is viability for, there's more viability for private currencies. And so regulations against um, privately issued currencies. Um, in terms of building, so it's actually easier to build a non um, fiat pegged currency legally than to build a fiat pegged one. Um, the reasons, if, I'll go into some of the reasons why this is very difficult to do now. Um, so if you look at how inflation is measured, it's usually, they, usually, usually, they usually use a, um, both CPI and PPI, consumer price index and producer price index, which are essentially baskets of goods. Um, from a crypto standpoint, the oracles behind these are crap. It's a bunch of economists working for economists, working for economists, reporting to a government institution. Um, there's not really a viability until we actually have kind of, um, until we have kind of liquid representation of um, the composition of CPI and PPI. It's very difficult to kind of build a decentralized oracle to create something to peg against that's not a fiat currency. In a sense, pegging to fiat is simply um, outsourcing the oracle problem to um, more mature actors for the meantime. Um, All right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce um, Kane Warwick of Haven Next. And Kane, I'll put up the screen for you in a moment. Awesome. Thank you. Cool. Let me stop sharing. You can start speaking, Kane. Cool, thank you. Um, so before I get started, I will caveat this with it's 3.30 in the morning in Australia. Um, I'm in Sydney, so if I am less than uh, eloquent, I apologize, because um, it's, uh, it's a bit early for me. Um, so I think the, the guys before me have covered uh, the ecosystem fairly well. Um, so I'm just gonna talk about Haven and, and our approach uh, specifically. So I've been running uh, payment startups for uh, about 20 years, um, payment and retail startups. I've been in retail for a long time. And, you know, the solution that we're trying to build is really a payment mechanism. 
And if you go back to the, the Bitcoin white paper and actually read the introduction, the first line of the white paper uh, is commerce on the internet has come to rely almost exclusively on financial institutions serving as trusted third parties to process electronic payments. And, and people, you know, we do sometimes forget, I think, that, you know, Bitcoin was actually designed to enable commerce on the internet. The, the you know, uh, massive focus of Bitcoin was uh, that you, you know, you need a decentralized solution to uh, moving value on the internet. The problem with Bitcoin, obviously, as we know, is the fixed monetary policy has led to uh, volatility. So what we're trying to solve is uh, a pragmatic solution. Um, and we're actually, uh, we're on mainnet. So, you know, this is, this is uh, while it's still an experimental solution, we're actually on the Ethereum mainnet. Uh, we have been for the last couple of weeks. So you can go on and, uh, and test out NUSD, which is our stable coin. Uh, you can hold um, Havens, which uh, is our collateral token uh, at the moment. And, and you can actually participate in the system. So, so what we're trying to do is build a decentralized payment network. That's, that's our goal. Um, and the way that we do that is by charging fees for transactions. And the fees that people pay when they're transacting in our stablecoin are paid to our collateral token holders. So it's a, it's a very similar uh, sort of dynamic to what you have in uh, proprietary closed loop payment networks like PayPal. Um, American Express uh, is quite similar as well, where in American Express, you've got uh, you know, merchants and consumers that are, are paying interest, they're paying uh, transaction fees, they're paying um, all of these various uh, costs within the network. And those fees are all sent to American Express, the company, um, the vast majority of which are used to actually continue um, you know, operating the entity. Uh, so it's about $35 billion in revenue that American Express uh generates each year, but about 5 billion of that is left over after all of the costs of you know, operating the, the network are taken out, um, you know, staffing, et cetera. So our view is that if you can decentralize uh, this same model and remove the need for a centralized entity uh, existing within the system, that you can build something that's much more efficient um, and that is censorship resistant, that's decentralized, that uh, is sort of open to anyone to participate. Um, and the, the way that that works is as I said, you, you have transactions that are, uh, that are made in the system. Um, and uh, as transactions are, are made, people pay fees and the fees go into a pool. And as a Haven holder, if you're holding our collateral token, you participate in stabilizing the ecosystem by locking the value of your uh, collateral um, into a smart contract and you actually issue into the network uh, the stable point. So you're incentivized uh, via this, uh, this field to uh, act as a, uh, a buyer of last resort, as a, a stabilizer. And we already have market makers and, and various other participants who are um, starting to, uh, to, to do this. So um, in the next, hopefully about five days, um, we'll have NUSD listed on a couple of exchanges, um, including uh, some uh, major exchanges, which will mean that we'll have some liquidity and volume that people will be able to come and participate in the ecosystem. And I think that that's really important uh, for us because, you know, while we have uh, Maker obviously as a, an alternative to the centralized fiat back solutions uh, like TrueUSD and Tether, uh, the, the big issue that I see in, uh, in, in a stablecoin system at the moment is scaling. Um, you know, it's not enough just to be stable and to have, you know, uh, five or 10 or $50 million worth of currency. Um, you know, the, the solution that we're trying to take on at the moment uh, within the crypto ecosystem is Tether. And, you know, Tether just recently, a couple of days ago, passed $3 billion in, uh, in circulating currency. So in order for us to be able to uh, sort of supplant uh, Tether as the solution out there, uh, we need to, to be able to show that we can scale. And so for us, the, the way that we scale the system is as the transaction fees uh, and as transaction volume within the system grows, uh, the yield that a Haven holder gets for staking the system increases, um, which uh, ideally should mean that the value of the Haven collateral token increases um, because the, the value of the network, the utility that's being created within the network uh, is increasing and that will allow us to issue uh, more currency. So it's it, while it is a, uh, a somewhat um, circular uh, solution, we believe that that will allow us to actually uh, you know, bootstrap and scale up the network. 
so that, that's that's essentially what we're trying to do. Um, you know, as I said, we're we're already on mainnet, um, so this is a solution that's uh, that's already been built. I see how you're planning to take on Tether as like the current solution, um, but what do you think about algorithmic models um, and the, kind of the time frame to see those come come to life? So I actually, uh, you know, as a, again, I'm I'm a pragmatic person. Uh, you know, our goal is to have something that is. Uh, you know, essentially uh, available to people as soon as possible, um, because I think it's important that we have these solutions out here. But I actually really like the algorithmic solutions. Um, I think that, you know, there's a lot of experimentation that's needed uh, in the space. Um, you know, this is such a, a strong need uh, for, for, you know, crypto, uh, for crypto projects to have a stable unit of account that's decentralized that they can use um, as opposed to, to, you know, creating their own unit of account or medium of exchange as their own token. Um, so I think that it's it's critically important that we have uh, a lot of different uh, solutions being tested and, and trialed. Um, but, you know, as I said, our, our solution is intended to be something that we can get to market quickly um, and that we can scale up quickly. And so that's what we've been really focused on and, and hence why you know, we're already on mainnet. And and uh, one question before we go on uh, uh, to the last speaker, um, you discussed uh, uh, the use of market makers. Can you just go into a little more detail about the role uh, that they're going to play and, and how they're getting compensated? Sure. So so I think within our ecosystem, uh, because you issue uh, stable coins into the network, um, at, you know, each haven holder does that. Uh, you know, a market maker, while they're a professional uh, sort of uh, entity at uh, providing liquidity and, and you know assisting to stabilize and arbitrage uh, various um, various markets. Essentially, any person who's issuing stable coins is incentivized within our system to ensure that they maintain the, maintain the collateralization ratio. Um, the our view is that over time there'll be people who build um, you know algorithms to to essentially step in and uh, perform this service to to arb. Uh, the the value of NUSD back to um, the US dollar, uh, which is you know a, a, essentially a profitable strategy. So right now the the market makers that we're working with are, are kind of there to provide that initial liquidity and, and ensure that you know, the order books are, are managed uh, closely. Thanks a lot. Uh, our final speaker will be Nevin Freeman of Reserve, and then we'll open up to questions. All right. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Excellent. Thanks, Lou and Leslie, for having me on here. Um, so I'm going to talk not a lot about reserve in particular because there's not much time. I want to kind of go through two points. One is I want to talk about the responsibility of stablecoin producers in the crypto ecosystem and our view on that. And then I'm going to spend some time trying to explain our framework for how to assess whether a stable coin is going to work. And I want to talk about that um, because I think that it's really important for people in the industry to kind of get up to speed on thinking about this because um, a lot of things could happen over the next couple of years. And I think it's important for people to understand um, kind of how to judge what's going to happen. So, um, so to start off, I think it's useful to reflect for a moment on the question of what money is and what it's meant to do. Um, I come from a little hippie town in Oregon and it was sort of thought that money was the source of evil and the source of problems and if you had a lot of money you were bad or greedy. Um, I think that people sometimes miss the sort of fundamental purpose of money and it's useful to keep this in mind when thinking about how a currency should really work. And so the way that I think about it is essentially that um, if someone does a favor for someone else and they use money to track that that favor was done, then what that allows is for that favor to be paid forward instead of paid back. So I think you can really sort of only understand the true purpose of money if you try to imagine the world without it. Um, and I think that if we didn't have money, then really people would only be able to do favors um, for people, for others in a, in a sort of small social group around them where you can kind of keep track of who's done favors for whom and pay those back instead of paying them forward. And so the fact that we have this kind of massive global cooperation game going on 
um, I think is really just because of the fact that we have these systems to track who's done favors for who. And so I, I, I say that because um, I think that that perspective is useful for thinking about what inflation really is. So in, inflation really is a degradation in that record of favors. So if your money is losing its value, that's essentially like, you know, you, you've done some favors, you have a record of that fact, but then that record kind of goes away pretty quickly over time and you can't call those favors in. And so this sort of, this means that people who are living in a country that has high inflation, and right now there are something like 16 countries that have 20% or higher annual inflation, they're living in a fundamentally less cooperative circumstance than we enjoy in the developed world. Um, and I think that that's a really big deal. And that's the thing that has gotten me personally excited about stable coins and, and sort of turning cryptocurrency into real money. So <clears throat> I think that it's very, it's very different creating a stable coin um, than creating some other cryptocurrency project, some, some app coin or, or some uh, distributed app that has a token. And I, I think that there's a huge amount of responsibility because I believe that this is going to be the first introduction to cryptocurrency for hundreds of millions, possibly even billions of people who are not purchasing the cryptocurrency in a speculative way. Um, they're not spending money that they can afford to lose in hopes that they'll earn a return. They're putting money in that they really can't afford to lose in hopes of having something safer and more stable than what they're used to. And so if a stablecoin project becomes very popular and then that protocol breaks and those people lose all of their money, that, that will be a disaster. That'll be really, really bad for those people. And it will also be really bad for the history of cryptocurrency because that's exactly the sort of event that would prompt governments um, to sort of organize to shut this whole thing down and sort of stop us from innovating such that even if we could have found something that really would have worked and would have been excellent um, for all those people in those situations, we might not have the opportunity to do it. And so this is kind of why I'm so motivated to try to help the industry think about what a stable coin is and try to guide us toward picking the ones that are gonna work and not piling onto ones that might not work. So I'll talk a little bit about assessing stability mechanisms. Essentially, I think that there are um, sort of three main three main concepts um, and you have to understand sort of in brief what a market depth chart is to understand these concepts. So a market depth chart is just a representation of um, you know, uh, who's willing to buy a currency at what price and who's willing to sell a currency at what price. So this is just a screenshot from GDAX, um, which is like part of Coinbase. You can see on the right, um, every time there's like a vertical line, that's some participant who has said, I'm willing to sell you know, this much currency um, at this price. And so you can see them sort of cumulatively stacking up. And the same thing on the, on the other side. And so um, if you understand what this chart means, um, then you can sort of understand what a buy wall is. So a buy wall gets its name because it produces this big wall in the chart. And basically, if you look at this chart here, um, basically what this represents is someone is willing to buy a huge amount of this currency that's being traded um, for a price that's very close to the current market price. Um, and so what that means is that if someone wanted to sell a bunch of currency, um, they wouldn't really move the market price. They'd just be selling the currency to the person who is willing to buy it for close to the same market price. Um, a sell wall is the same thing in reverse. So it's just someone who's willing to sell a huge amount of the currency at very close to the current market price. And so similarly, um, it would be hard to move the price in that direction. And I talk about these things because, um, uh, oh, sorry, the final concept is arbitrage. So arbitrage is a simple concept that, that people sometimes um, mistake. It's not just buying something low and selling it high later. It's buying something low and selling it high at exactly the same time. And um, essentially, if you have, uh, so, so, so to put this all together, if there is a single exchange for a particular currency and some market participant is willing to provide a very large buy wall and a very large sell wall at uh, the current market price, then that means that um, until all of those buys and sells are actually taken by some other market participant, that market price can't move. And then because of arbitrage, arbitrage is sort of what keeps the price of Bitcoin roughly the same across all exchanges, right? So if you can buy Bitcoin at one price and sell it for a slightly higher price than some other exchange, um, that's sort of a risk-free profit and market participants will always take a risk-free profit. And so that causes the exchanges to sort of come into line 
and have the same price across all the different exchanges. So in order to peg a currency, all someone has to be able to do is number one, maintain a buy wall for that currency. Um, number two, maintain a sell wall for that currency. And this can all just be on one exchange. Um, and then because of the arbitrage opportunity, all the other exchanges will be brought into line. And I go through this because this is fundamentally the, the basic set of market mechanisms behind what an exchange rate peg is. And um, an exchange rate peg is, is essentially, that's, that's what all of these stablecoin projects are trying to implement, right? So you're basically trying to borrow the stability of some existing currency um, and port it into a cryptocurrency. And so um, now we can ask sort of the question of, well, how do exchange rate pegs break? And given this sort of background framework, you can see that it's, it's pretty simple. Essentially, if that main market participant um, stops being able to provide either a buy wall or a sell wall, then the market price can drift in one direction or the other. And that's all it really means for a peg to break. So if you're a small country and you're pegging your currency to the dollar or the euro, um, if, you, if you're holding you know, dollars or euros um, in, in your reserve account, then if you run out of those, then you stop being able to provide uh, a buy wall for your currency. It's much less likely that you would stop being able to provide a sell wall because if you're in charge of the currency, you can always mint more. So basically, the thing that causes an exchange rate peg to break in sort of the normal world is if a country runs out of currency um, in reserve, or if they have currency in reserve and they're unwilling to spend it to defend the peg for some reason, then that buy wall goes away, even though they have the assets held in reserve. So this means that um, there's a very, very simple framework you can use for assessing the viability of an exchange rate peg. Number one is to look at the value of the assets held in reserve. And number two is to look at the credibility of the promise to spend those reserves defending the peg. And so if, if a stablecoin system or a country that's paying its currency has enough assets held in reserve um, in order to be able to repurchase its currency um, and maintain that buy wall, and um, they actually really reliably use those assets to defend the peg, um, then the peg will hold. And if either of these two is violated, then it won't. Um, and so we found this tremendously useful for analyzing a lot of different stablecoin proposals and a lot of ideas that we've come up with in, uh, in building reserve. So um, there's one more step that you kind of have to be able to make to apply this to stablecoins. Um, because some of them don't actually have a hard reserve. And, and so they have what I call an implied reserve. And so I'll just give one simple example of this with a popular protocol that a lot of people probably already understand to try to explain how we apply this framework to a decentralized stable coin. So I'll use basis, um, which is an interesting and clever mechanism. So I'll assume uh, for now that people understand this protocol. Um, go check it out later if, if you haven't understood it. So in the basis system, the implied reserve is just the number of dollars worth of uh, base bonds that market participants will buy at any given point before they stop being willing to buy them, right? Because you, you can essentially think of it as all of these speculators have some amount of capital held privately and um, however many dollars worth of base bonds they'll buy is equivalent to the number of dollars worth of uh, the stable coins that can be taken out of circulation. So that implied reserve, there's not a single reserve account, there's kind of this decentralized reserve that's held by all those different speculators. And so then you can think about the size of the reserve is just the number of dollars that they are holding. And then the credibility of the promise is just the, the question of how reliably will they be willing to spend those dollars to defend the peg. And so you can always make this translation for a stablecoin system to look at the implied reserve um, and assess the size of that reserve and the credibility of the promise. And we think that this is the right way to think about whether um, a stable coin, whether it's asset backed or algorithmic, um, is, is likely to work. Um, so that's kind of my, my basic framework that I wanted to share. Um, and so like I mentioned, we're building um, an algorithmic stable coin called Reserve, um, which I don't have time to explain right now, but uh, the basic premise is we try to lock up enough crypto collateral so that the um, actual reserve size is always sufficient um, and very easy to assess because all that collateral is just locked up in a smart contract and then maintain a highly credible promise to maintain the peg uh, because it's all executed by code that anyone can read and see that that will always work. Um, so 
uh, check us out at reserve.org and, and watch the site over the next few months if you want to learn more. Okay, terrific. Thanks a lot, Nevin. Um, so I'm now, uh, uh, we're going to read some of the questions uh, that have been asked by the audience. Uh, and if you're in the audience and have questions, feel free to type it in the Q&A. Um, I'll start with a, a question, and this is for everybody. It's a, it's a good question. Uh, can you give us, um, uh, you know, whatever insight you're able to in terms of the timing of the launch of uh, each of your projects? And, and Nevin, why don't we start with you? Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, uh, software development is, is hard to predict, especially when you need to make sure that there are zero bugs in the code. Um, and so my lawyers don't want me to make any very specific predictions, um, but I'll say that we're uh, doing live tests on the Robson testnet right now. And we think that by the end of the year um, or sometime shortly thereafter, um, we'll be live on the mainnet. Thanks, Ido? Yeah, um, so a, a very similar answer, uh, which is that we expect to launch uh, Saga within Q4 uh, this year. Uh, for us, the long pole is to ensure that we're working with enough banks um, to hold the Saga reserves um, and to attest daily for what they're holding um, to mitigate counterparty risks. So th this is the long pole uh, in terms of, of code. We are very close to being release ready. And uh, how many banks um, do you kind of need to get online to, to feel comfortable? So uh, the, the question is not only how many banks, but uh, across uh, how many jurisdictions. Um, so we are working to work, uh, we're looking to work with uh, no less than four banks and uh, hopefully at least in two or three jurisdictions. Our main jurisdiction is, is Switzerland, where we are uh, working closely with, uh, with FINMA, the Swiss uh, Financial Authority. Um, but we're looking to expand our uh, banking partners, the ones that are holding and attesting for the reserve to, to uh, various jurisdictions. Okay, great. Kane? Uh, yeah, so as I mentioned, uh, we are on mainnet right now. Um, so we've got, uh, we've got a little under a million dollars in circulating uh, NUSD, a stable coin. Um, we've obviously got a roadmap uh, that we're rolling out over the next few months to um, add you know, additional uh, support for different currencies, uh, as well as listings on exchanges, uh, you know, over the next week or so. Um, so yeah, just recently launched. Okay, terrific. And Sam, if you can unmute. Going once, going twice. Sam? I think for Sam, it would Wait, here we go. Okay. Yeah, so um, I can't give, a, as, as, as most people, I can't give it a specific time. What I will say is that um, we've been focused on product um, for the past couple months, and we've been leveraging our extensive um, network um, in the Valley, Stanford, um, MIT, and so forth, to um, drive um, the drive product forward. Um, and we're hoping to kind of define ourselves not by what we say, but what we, by what we build. Okay, terrific. Okay. Thanks. The... Um, uh, Ido, I think this is for you, although, you know, if anybody else wants to chime in too, there's a question about uh, uh, the role, I guess, of, uh, of the Oracle in stabilizing the coin. Um, I, I, our method of stab stabilizing the coin uh, is not through the usage uh, of external oracles um, in, in the sense that the stability of, of the coin is just like Nevin uh, uh, um, rightfully stated is is in the fact that the the contract ensures um, that the, the peg uh, the reserve adequacy according to the price of the coin uh, is being maintained and that the framework is there for us not to be the one that are testing how much there is in reserve um, and for the contract to execute the, the liquidation of the reserve to to be able to support the, the peg um, so I'm, I'm Frankly, not sure that I understand the question. I, I can I can give a, a perhaps useful answer here. So, with many algorithmic stablecoin designs, um, the protocol needs to react to the market price, and the reason why that is the case is that um, the protocol will often want to provide a buy wall when the price of the stablecoin is less than the pegged price, and not necessarily provide the buy wall when the price is, is larger than the paid price, is higher than the paid price. And so essentially what an oracle is, 
um, is some sort of way to get information about the market pricing of an asset um, or any other information in the world for that matter onto the blockchain. So essentially, if you, if you imagine that you are a smart contract and you're operating inside of this, you know, this interesting virtual machine um, that's being run by 30,000 miners around the world, um, you have access to a very limited set of information. And so somehow the information about that market pricing uh, or whatever it is needs to make it to that smart contract. And that's a difficult thing to do in a trustless way and in a secure way uh, because you can't have Ethereum miners or, or miners of any other type all query the API um, of a bunch of different exchanges because then you'd have you know, 30,000 or however many API requests going all the time. It'd be um, expensive in terms of gas prices and it would be um, difficult to deal with for the APIs on these exchanges. And so what, um, what, what tends to happen is either you have a system where users can submit price information to the blockchain with some set of economic incentives to incentivize them to submit the truth, or um, you can have uh, a computer that has sort of special secure hardware that's aggregating the information from a bunch of exchanges and then sort of securely posting that in a transaction to the blockchain periodically in a way where the smart contract can remotely attest that the information that was provided um, is accurate. Okay, thanks. And I think this is a question, um, you know, that uh, uh, can be for everybody, but, you know, and it relates to, um, uh, I guess, you know, Preston Byrne said that uh, uh, all, I guess, uh, this is the question that all algorithmic stable coins uh, are due to fail. Um, and it'd be interesting just to get, you know, feedback from uh, the panelists on kind of their thoughts of the future of you know, and I know we've already talked about a little bit, but of, of algorithmic stable coins. And um, if anybody knows, which I don't, uh, exactly what uh, Preston Byrne was referring to. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I think that, uh, first of all, Preston Barnes is, is quite critical of all stable coins, not only algorithmic stable coins. Um, but I think that the reference to algorithmic stable coins is, is, is to stable coins that are not uh, holding a peg in the asset that they're wanting to stabilize against. Um, and, and, and I think I, I share uh, this concern, um, which is the following. Um, uh, there are several attempts to migrate the volatility in price into a volatility in, in the quantity of money. Um, the, the, I'm, I'm simplifying uh, quite a lot, but um, it is setting a target, uh, for example, of, 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 of a coin to $1. And then if the coin price uh, jumps to $2, then if we will double the supply of money, then um, it will go back to being $1, uh, which works uh, perfectly. Uh, but when it comes to downside protection, um, the decrease in the price of, of, of a coin, uh, a fundamental decrease in the price of a coin, is, is a fundamental decrease in the trust that this currency enjoys. Uh, and then we are seeing several solutions, such as issuing bonds to, to buy the excess of supply of money. Uh, and this solution relies on the trust of people that this currency will go back into growth. So it is really trusting uh, uh, the longevity of the growth of a currency and in the fluctuation of trust that we're currently seeing in the market, uh, which are no small fluctuation, but uh, uh, um, acute changes in the trust that uh, digital currencies are enjoying, um, this, uh, uh, this reliance on, on uh, people uh, belief that a certain currency will go back into growth uh, seems, uh, seems to be rather fragile. I, sorry, uh, I think the, there is a, a philosophical response to Preston. Um, and I've, I've spoken to Preston quite a bit uh, in the past, and, and you know he's a very thoughtful guy. But if you if you took him back to two thousand six or, or something like that, I think he would potentially be say the exact same thing about uh, you know a solution like Bitcoin. Um, if you're on the other side of a bet, saying that something is not possible when you can't demonstrate that it isn't. Uh, I think that's a dangerous place to be. So uh, I find it, uh, I'm a bit skeptical of just a, an instant dismissal of algorithmic uh, stable coins when, you know, you can't really demonstrate that they won't work. Uh, it's fine to be skeptical, but I think a lot of experimentation will probably 
uh, render that uh, prediction uh, pretty silly in the long term. Okay, well, thanks, uh, thanks for that, uh, Kane and 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 Ido. Um, and uh, with that, we're at the top of the hour. So thanks everybody for um, for participating on the call. We've got a lot of questions that we didn't get to. I'm going to ask the speakers, and we'll send them the list of questions, and uh, we'll ask the speakers uh, uh, if they uh, answer some of them. And uh, we'll post that on the blog post that we'll put up on the blog along with the replay of the call uh, uh, in a few days. Uh, and with that, uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Ido, Sam, Kane, Nevin, and, uh, and uh, uh, most especially uh, uh, Leslie for, uh, for, for putting the call together um, uh, with us. And uh, thanks, everybody, for attending. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks.